Greetings everyone and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or as we go along and you enjoy what you are hearing, please show that subscribe button some love and set your notification bell to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Okay, so I have two encounters from the same place, told to me by someone who went there. For context, this was in a school. The school had a large oval with a fence around it. Weird, but it was a good school. It was a great area not known for bad vibes or anything. It was in a suburban, so a lot of homes around. Story 1. Four years ago, there was this woman. She was around her 40s. I mean, she had a stroller, so she probably had a young child. Anyways... She would take her phone out and record the schoolyard. For context, there was a big dirt hill leading down to the entree of the school. It's a direct path to a lot of suburbs, and at the highest point, you can see the whole school oval. She came for about a week and would record while the school was outside, a lunch and recess, and then she disappeared. Never came back. Probably never will. Story number two. One year ago, same school. This time, it was a man, sketchy, wearing a black hoodie, shoes, pants, etc. He came up to a group of younger girls, and I kid you not, asked if they wanted a photo. The girls actually said yes, probably out of fear, but then they were hiding behind trees, etc. He was quick, took the photo, and sped down the path. A teacher was called, but the man was already gone. He was probably mid-twenties or so. Unfortunately, no camera footage would have been recorded as there was no cameras around. I don't know if he'll come back, but we didn't see him for the rest of the year. Disclaimer. I don't think all homeless people are crazy or bad-intentioned or creepy. I do think my encounter with this homeless person was creepy, however. This happened in 2019. I was 25 at the time. I was living with my parents, sister, and my partner at the time, as we were saving up to buy a house. My parents' house was in a relatively big city in California, which has a big homeless population. The house was on a street that dead ended to a park, which was a common hangout spot for homeless people. There was always homeless people walking by our house. Most of them never caused any problems. The other piece of this backstory you need to know is that my sister is special needs. She, despite being 19 at the time, appeared both physically and mentally more like a 10-year-old. This particular day, my mom and I had taken her dogs to the vet. My partner was at work, and my dad was working in the backyard. This left my sister kind of alone in the house. When my mom and I came back from the vet, my sister opened the door and greeted us, saying, This is my friend Julia. Behind her stood a woman who looked like she was probably in her 20s. She had my sister's socks on and was eating food from our house. This was confusing because the woman could have been a friend of my sister's as she was in a lot of programs for adults with special needs and we didn't necessarily know all of her friends. But my sister also has a limited vocabulary to explain situations with. So my mom says, Oh, you know my daughter? Julia says, We are getting to know each other. 
Uh, nope. My mom says, how are you getting to know her? Oh, well, I just live around the corner. You live around the corner? No, no, I live on the corner. I, I needed a tampon so your daughter let me in. At this point, my mother is speechless. I have never seen her speechless in my life. I am whispering to her, get her out. Julia is kind of pacing around, grabbing more food from our kitchen. She's acting erratically, like she's on drugs. I again tell my mom, please get her the fuck out of here. My mom says, I know that, but what if she has a knife or gun or something? I need to do it carefully. My mom follows Julia into the kitchen and says, I am sorry, um, but you need to leave because I need to go run an errand. Julia ignores this request. At this point, I look into our bathroom where there is a pile of Julia's things. Again, my mother tells her she needs to leave. Julia agrees and goes into our bathroom and locks the door. She was in there a while. It felt like forever, actually, but it was probably around five minutes. We were pretty certain she is doing drugs. Finally, Julia has all of her stuff and leaves, taking socks and snacks with her. I run to my dad, and we all debrief. It seems like what we can get out of our sister is that Julia knocked on the door asking for a tampon, in which my sister lets her in, trying to be helpful. Julia then realizes she is practically alone with what looks like a child and takes full advantage, stealing clothes and shoes from everyone. We have a serious talk with my sister and tell her she can never open up doors for strangers, and we spend the next few months worrying that Julia would spread the news that our house was an easy house to get into. Friend and I, both 21-year-old females, went to Applebee's for a few $1 margaritas, then went off to a park where she said she knew a spot. We go 20 minutes away to this park. We go down this path that takes us around 10 minutes to this bay area. We find a nice log and sit there and watch the sunset. As we were relaxing on the log, a family strolls by with their dog to hang out on the other side of the shore. A few minutes go by and a couple comes through and sets up. They eat a big pineapple with a knife? That's weird. Anyway, the sun sets but it's still light out. We didn't think about the walk back. Eventually, we go to head back and it's very dark. The wooden area we have to walk through is getting extremely darker. We start walking, and she gets her phone camera out. It's pitch black at this point. We start talking about how creepy it was. I felt an uneasy feeling. That feeling you get, afraid that something is right behind you. Well, we're walking along. We go across the bridge up a little hill, and all of a sudden, we hear loud, fast footsteps on the bridge. I see light from what appeared to be from his phone, going back and forth as if he was sprinting. We panicked. We started running, and I'm thinking, no way this guy is chasing us. His footsteps kind of sounded like he was on a bike. I thought, we'll go up the steep hill on our left. No way this guy is following us, and no way he'd go up a hill on his bike. Turns out, there was no bike. We stopped running as we didn't hear anything. She flashes her light behind us, and there is a silhouette of a man jogging towards us. His body posture seemed to be that of a person who had tired easily from running. We kept running and stopping to see if he was still chasing us. And then again, we hear footsteps running towards us. We keep looking back while running to make sure he's not right on us. At this point, my friend screamed, Hey! in a panicked voice, and he screamed back, Hey! Then after that, they said, What are you, scared? We kept running. She's on the phone with the police. 
we finally hit a paved road, nowhere near her car. When I took us up the hill, that was the wrong path we originally took. We knock on a house, lights are on, but no one answers. We start down the road to their neighbor. I look back and see a silhouette of a man walking behind the first person's house. He got up to the fence and creeped back into the darkness. The second neighbor helped us. His wife got us some water and the police came to take us to her car. That was the most traumatic experience I think I have ever had. The intentions of that man felt sinister, and the way he was yelling at us felt so uncanny. I hate this feeling I have, and I have so many questions that won't be answered. I can't get this one question out of my head. What would have happened if he caught us? This story is told as it happened from my perspective. I'm from Finland, and that's also where these things I'm about to describe to you happened. This was many, many years ago. Pre-smartphone era, sometime in the 90s. Yes, I'm old. Hush. It was the end of summer. Myself and two friends were on a camping trip way up in the north in Lapland. The mosquito season was over, and the weather was cooling down in anticipation of the coming fall. The three of us had packed food and gear for a 10-day trek. I used to be quite the avid outdoorsman in my youth. The car we arrived in had been left in the parking lot of a visitor center within the premises of the Yorho Kokonian National Park a 985-square-mile stretch of wilderness near the Russian border. The terrain there varies greatly from treeless and semi-mountainous. We don't have real mountains in Finland, but we have what we like to call Tunturi, which is close, to somewhat dense forests of spruce and birch. There are lots of swamps. Seeing reindeer is not uncommon, and some nights you might hear wolves in the distance. You can theoretically run into a bear in this place, but of course normally they avoid people. We mostly camped in a tent, but some nights we used shelters and simple huts provided for travelers free of charge by the forestry service and finish. The trip had lasted five days. We were at the furthest of any kind of civilization we were going to be on that particular outing. Truly in the middle of nowhere. There really is nothing there. There are no villages, towns, or industry. The place is a massive national park after all. Seeing other hikers happen from time to time. You'd see some people in the distance maybe. Very rarely you have not face to face with anyone. So, in the middle of our trip, we had camped in a small clearing, woodland extending around us for a considerable distance in all directions. It was already dark. We had eaten our evening meal, and all three of us were jammed into our only tent. It was a bit cramped, but we fit. It was a large tent. We took turns carrying it during the hikes. We were just exchanging some jokes and crude humor in the dark, like guys in their 20s do, about to go to sleep in our sleeping bags. When we quieted down, we began to hear it, talking, and the sound of machinery. Given our location, this was profoundly weird. We camped in a tent because there was no huts nearby. Maybe there was another camp somewhere near us? We couldn't quite make out what was being said, but it was a human voice for sure, no doubt about it. Distant droning, but nothing really could explain the sound of heavy machinery. It sounded like an excavator or a tank, something huge and powerful and really not too far away. Combined with the sound of talking, we thought, okay, maybe it's a construction yard. But at that time of night, in an unpopulated, protected nature reserve, we got out of our tent, 
It was cold and pitch black. The campfire had some coals still glowing. We took out our flashlights. My two buddies have always been a little bit braver than myself. The sound was clearly coming from the direction of the north, maybe half a kilometer away. We thought the construction might be going on behind a small hill some distance away. We could see no lights or anything. We still could not make out what was being said. The speaking-like voice was mononymous, and it was impossible even to say what language was being used. Still sounded like a person speaking, though. You may be aware of the sort of spooky phenomenon of hearing a human voice in static, right? Maybe you've used a blow dryer and been sure someone is talking. Turn it off and it was just something the brain tried to interpret from the steady hum. Maybe it was sort of like that. It's hard to explain. The machinery-like sound continued. Not loud, but you could sort of make out the powerful engine at times accelerating and adding power at times at idle. My two friends resolved to go find out what was going on. We put our warm clothes back on, donned boots, and I sat next to the dying fire, added some more wood to it. I would stay at camp while my buddies left to check out this mystery construction yard in the middle of nowhere in the Lapland woods. So there I sat. The guys took out their maps, took a compass heading, and left and I could hear them making their way through the forest, see the light from their flashlights. They were gone. The weird sounds continued, unaltered. They were gone, 15 minutes, then maybe 30, then the better part of an hour. It was odd, judging by the volume of the sound. They should have reached it by now, maybe checked it out and been back already. I added more firewood and tried to make out what the person or persons talking was saying, but it was too teeny and obscure. Soon the guys had been away for over two hours. I figured they had stayed for coffee with the construction guys or something. Then the sound stopped. Just like that, it just ended. All at the same time. The engine sound and the voice both just quit. It was very silent. I waited for another 30 minutes, very worried now that something had happened, that maybe my friends were lost. Should I go and try to find them? I shouted their names several times and built the fire pretty big. I was scared shitless when suddenly I saw the flashlights of my friends approaching. Apparently, they were returning in a hurry. The guys got back to camp out of breath. They told me the following. They had followed the sound beyond the small ridge in the distance. There was nothing there, and it seemed like they were not getting any closer to the source of the sounds. They had to stop every now and again, be quiet, and listen to be able to walk towards it. They walked and stopped like this for some time, then realized they were not getting any closer. The sound did not change in volume at all. They decided to go a bit further several times, when suddenly the sound would just stop like somebody pressed a button on a recording. They realized that they had been going on for a long time. They were in the middle of the dark woods alone. They reversed the heading and starting back at a brisk pace. Eventually, they saw my big-ass fire from the top of a hill and found their way back. The weird thing is, we seem to think the sound stopped at different times. They had been gone two and a half hours total. They said the sound stopped at around the one hour, 15 minute mark after they left. They then started to head back immediately, return trip taking a little bit longer, even though they kept at a good pace. They apparently wandered around for a bit, semi-lost in the dark. For me, the sound stopped at the two-hour mark, just 30 minutes before they returned. We did not sleep that night. Nothing more happened on that trip, and we never found out what that weird construction yard-like sound was about. 
When we returned to the Park Visitor Center some five days later, we asked around, but no one knew of any ongoing construction taking place in the whole National Park area. It's been bugging me ever since. I'll preface this with a question. Do you ever get a sinking feeling of impending danger? Because I did in the backwoods around Solom Hill, Berkshire, UK. Just the feeling that the vibe of a place is completely rotten when moments ago it was almost idyllic. I've got the weekend to myself as my partner is away for a few days. Something I like to do is go for night drives and stop somewhere in the sticks and go for a peaceful walk when not too many people were around. So I get in the car and put in the directions to a little car park in some woods about 10 miles out. As I drive down the motorway, the sun's very neatly set. It looked great. Everything bathed in orange. I leave at the junction and the motorway becomes dual carriageway, which in turn becomes a single B road. I turn off onto the lane and pass through the last village before a nice bit of hilly conifer woodland looms large in the twilight. I was going here particularly because I heard there was a nice viewpoint of Reading Town. I don't make it that far. Now I'm going up country tracks single lane only, so I'll have to pull over to let someone pass if they're going the other way. That doesn't happen. No one else is on the road. The hedgerows give way to woodland. It's very pretty, and I can still hear birdsong in the dying daylight. Eventually, I reach the car park, although really it's just a patch of gravel for turning around, and a forestry commission gate blocks off the dirt path deeper into the woods. In the car park, there's a motorhome. Although it looks like no one's in it, there's also a dark blue Ford Fiesta EcoBoost with a fella in it on his phone. I park in the corner behind the motorhome and two spaces over from the Ford and get out. There's a meadow across the road from the car park, so I'll walk to that to see if there's a path that may lead to the viewpoint. I've not been here before. No viewpoint, but a single deer, so nice. After that, I cross over again and decide to use the track behind the forestry gate. Even if I don't find the viewpoint, it will be a really nice walk, I think, and begin walking. The man in the little car isn't on his phone anymore. He gets out. I take a few more steps, but I'm already feeling a creepy dread. I look over at the man. There's now a second man, and the pair of them are dressed in dark, practical clothes with boots. They're very tall. They don't say anything to each other. Their faces are made of stone. I've stopped now. I pretend to be on my phone. I try not to look directly, but out at my peripheral, I catch them taking turns to sneak looks at me. So, I look at them directly, and one is just watching me as they walk towards the same path. I was about to head down. I just stand there as they walk by, and they keep looking at me in alternation, even turning their heads as they're in front of me now to look at what I'm doing. They disappear behind some hedges, looking at me one more time before they go. The dread feeling... The rotting feeling is very strong. I've had this danger feeling only twice before. One time the danger was perceived, the other time very immediate. At this point I decide absolutely not and go straight back to my car and get in. I can see the man again from the car. I can see around the bushes and they're just standing there watching me. The entire time I got ready and drove out of the car park, turning onto the road, they're just standing there, watching. 
I hope I was just being paranoid, but I know the difference deep down. Paranoia makes you jump out of your own skin and shadow, and you start feeling anxious. This feeling was cold and a solid feeling in my gut. You became hyper aware of your surroundings and also the object of your dread, in this case, the men. I just had a terrible feeling about them, unlike any other stranger I had ever come across. I didn't think I would be sharing the story, but I'm very happy that I did. Has anyone else gotten the feeling I'm talking about? Have you had that one before? What do you think those men would have done to me had I continued walking? Hello everyone, my name is Chase and I have a story from the Perry State Forest and my home that neither me nor my friends will ever forget. But before that, here is some backstory. We lived bordering the Perry State Forest on a large hill. My entire immediate family lived on this hill. My grandfather, aunt, uncle, cousins, my mother, father, and me. My aunt and uncle had a medium-sized farm and raised many goats and had free roam chickens. It was extremely common for the animals to go missing. We honestly just chalked it up to the coyotes until we caught a mountain lion on one of our trail cams. Mind you, we live in Southern Ohio. We aren't supposed to have mountain lions here. Yet there was one with its own den in our woods, our wild woods. We always had odd things happen at night, seeing shadows, hear loud knocks, whispers, screams, footsteps, even hearing drums in the wood every year around Halloween. You know, pretty creepy stuff. But moving forward, let's get into the meat of this story. My first encounter that I can remember is when I was maybe eight years old and fell asleep late in my living room. We had a very large window with a TV to the left of it in the corner of the room. I woke up and looked at the clock, and it was about 3 a.m., and the TV was buzzing static. I looked out the window from the couch, and there it was. A tall man wearing a brown cloak, likely made of deer skin, and a deer head covering his face, standing in the window with a little Indian girl in braids to his right. He stood there and stared at me for a long time, then waved to me in a way that said, Come outside. It's okay. Just come on out. After I freaked out and just sat there in shock, they both walked out of view of the window. I had a sudden urge to follow, but I stayed put and cried out of fear. I then ran to my room and eventually fell back asleep. The next morning, I explained what had happened to me earlier that night, and my mother told me it was a friendly Indian chief who was just paying a visit, meaning no harm. I had since then blocked the experience from my memory and pretty much forgot that it even happened. Until years later, my mom set me down and told me the truth. That chief had been around for a very long time and terrorized everyone on the hill, and staring at them from a distance since they first moved in around 1999. She told me, according to her knowledge, that he was from the Adena tribe, and during this time, he would collect kids from the surrounding tribes and take them away for human sacrifices. She then further explained that he wasn't waving me hello, he was waving me on, to follow him outside with the Indian girl, to do God knows what with me once I was alone in the woods. She said he is evil, and my mother doesn't use that word often, but she said, whatever that thing is, it's evil, and don't you ever go out there in the woods alone at night. Don't even go with friends. Stay as far away from the deep woods. There's an evil that really does live there. 
And so, of course, I didn't listen. And me and my friends quickly learned our lesson. Me and my two friends, we will call them Andy and Jeremy, decide to have some spooky fun after a long and boring night. We were all 17 to 18 years of age, so we hatched the plan to go into the woods and into the Perry State Forest to try to scare ourselves and just mess around and have a fun time. After all, there were roads in the forest that was only a couple of miles long. For example, in a 20-minute drive, you could easily make it right into the city. It was a straight shot, one single road with no turns. We decided to drive because hoping it out there was just a little too ballsy for our taste. In all honesty, we just love the rush of being spooked. Andy and Jeremy are, or at least were, the furthest thing from superstitious. For they didn't believe uh, anything unless they could see it or feel it themselves. And that's exactly what they got. We were in my father's car, a manual BMW. It was a fast car, and we felt oh so cool driving it around. The time was approaching 2.30 a.m. when we slowly drove into the forest after turning off the main road. Upon entering the forest, we felt a wave of something come crashing into us. It felt as if we were phasing through a wall that wasn't there. The air felt heavy and thick, and we felt extreme pressure on our chests. This made our eyes tear up, and it was hard to breathe. There was no pain, just an overwhelming feeling of sadness, anger, guilt, dread, regret, and emotional distress. It honestly felt like every bad feeling you could possibly feel all together at once. It felt like we needed to turn around and say, forget it. But we wanted this. We wanted to feel scared. It's what we came here for in the first place. So we continued driving through the weird wall of bad feelings. And we all just thought we got that weird feeling because we were in the middle of the woods at night. And it was light and dark out. And I mean really dark out. It was a new moon, so we didn't have any light. It made sense at the time, yet the headlights were only able to see about a yard in front of us, which was not normal for the LED lights my dad had installed. We talked amongst ourselves about how weird that feeling we got was when we entered the forest. Then, out of nowhere, we saw a large black figure standing to the left side of the road, and just watched us drive by. And by the time we passed it, it was gone. And when I say black, it wasn't just black. It was darker than anything I've ever seen before. The darkness of the forest behind it almost looked bright in comparison. We checked in the rearview mirror, and it had just vanished. Poof. Gone. Like it was never there in the first place. We said some obscenities to each other, completely stunned and aghast at what we had just witnessed. We drove for about a whole minute in silence until Andy said, Did y'all see that shit? We all agreed with a simple, uh-huh. We continued to drive. After a little while, Andy looks up in the sky and says, Uh, guys, the sky looks kind of off. Me and Jeremy looked up, and the sky wasn't just off, it was blood red. Yet it was so dark in the forest that you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. We thought maybe it was starting to get daylight out, but it was only 2.32 a.m. We were perplexed at how little time passed since we entered, and how on earth the sky could be lit up in such a dark red. At first, we thought it was possibly a blood moon, yet there was no moon to be seen. We continued on our journey for what felt like a half an hour in a straight line. Then suddenly, Andy yelped and said, Nope, 
nope, nope, nope. We just seen that tree. I just seen that tree. It's like we are going in a circle. You didn't take any turns, did you, Chase? I denied with a simple, uh, no, why would I? It's a straight line through here. I don't want to get lost, especially out here. And so we continue to pass the same trees, the same guardrail, the same lake, the same signs, the same exact everything over and over and over again. Everything kept repeating as if we were driving in a big circle, but that's impossible since the road is only a straight line through. There are many turns that we could have taken, but we never turned, not once. Damn, man, this feels like some Blair Witch shit, Jeremy murmured. As we continued to drive through the endless loop, we were now apparently stuck in. Over time, we slowly started to see dark figures in the woods, shadows, things staring at us in the trees, and scariest of all, deer that did not look right. Something was off about them. They would all just stand there and stare at the car and sway back and forth, yet unlike how normal deer, eyes glow when lights hit them. There was no glow, like a black, empty void within each eyeball. Then one spontaneously jumped in front of the car, making us all physically recoil and brace for the impact of a deer entering my front grill. But it never happened. It disappeared just as quickly as it had jumped in front of us. No, man, this isn't right. We need to turn around. That can't happen. This isn't real, Jeremy said to me. I told him that we wouldn't be far from the exit after all we'd been driving for what felt like hours. So we continued driving down the dirt road when we noticed the tall figures in the woods to slowly transform into a more human-like figure. We also started seeing disembodied eyes staring at us and heard odd distorted animal noises, screams and whimpers. We suddenly all had something in our heads telling us to just stop the car, stop the car and get out and everything will stop. We all shook off the eerie feeling that came over us. We then heard whispers, but these were no ordinary whispers. They sounded like they were coming from in Inside the car. Again, we continued to drive. While driving, we only sporadically get a glimpse of the thing we seen at the very beginning when we entered. Then, abruptly, all the visions and sounds stopped. We then heard a girl scream. Not a coyote or a bobcat. It was a girl, and it wasn't in the woods. It was right in all of our ears. It was loud enough to make our ears ring. Then the car shut off. Dead. No lights on. No nothing. Just off. Pitch. Black. Darkness. I tried to start it in nothing. While trying to start the car, we heard a train in the distance. And it sounded like we were on the tracks ourselves. Hell, we could feel the ground rumbling. But the odd thing was... There was not a railroad anywhere near the park, not for many, many miles. So how is that we could hear the chug of the engine, the whistle, and the screeching of the wheels? We had absolutely no idea. It got closer and closer until it sounded like the train was inside the car, passing right through us, while the train was going through the car. That car came back to life. All the lights on, just like normal. So I started it, tried to take off, and killed it. It was a manual, and I was scared it was my own error, but it still scared me when the car lurched to a stop. I then started it again and took off. We were fleeing for our lives at this point, so we were easily hitting 50 miles per hour on a shitty gravelly road. We continued to pass the same thing over and over again. 
I then abruptly slammed on my brakes. Damn, dude. What the hell, man? Andy and Jeremy both yelled at my face, planted into the front seats. Guys, look. They looked up in awe to see two car headlights coming right at us, growing bigger by the second. I was stopped and I panicked and instead of driving out of the way, which there wasn't any real out of the way since we are on this very narrow road, I started to flash my lights at them, hoping they would see us and stop. But they didn't. They continued to get closer and closer. So we all just accepted our fates and put our heads down to protect us from the collision. We waited and waited and nothing happened. We all looked up, and it had all just vanished, just like the deers had previously. No car, no tread marks, no dust cloud, nothing. It was just all in our heads, I guess. At this point, we knew something was in our heads, warping reality and making us perceive whatever it wanted us to see. We continued down the road after about 15 minutes of relative peace other than the screams and human figures and other horrific things happening, the radio randomly switched on, and we heard people talking on the radio through static. But they weren't just radio hosts. It was people. So many people talking at once that it was deafening. We heard loud knocking and banging on the doors and windows, enough to shake the car. The voices in our heads were now screaming at us to stop driving, to roll down the windows, to get out of the car, to do anything to let them in. Everything was deafening. It was so insanely loud and we all started weeping. We just gave up. We couldn't handle it anymore. Then, in the blink of an eye, we appeared on the new reservoir road right before the city. We all looked at each other completely stunned on how in the hell we just teleported to the end of the dirt road, out of the forest. The radio was still blaring static, so reached down and turned it down, so we could talk amongst ourselves. I looked and seen the time was now 3 a.m. How did such little time pass? How did we get here? We had no clue, and we still don't. We were just glad it was over. We drove away to the city. The sky slowly faded from red to black. We stopped at the 24-hour Taco Bell and got some food and sat in the parking lot talking about what we had all just experienced. We then drove back to my dad's and walked up to the front door, exhausted. Then right before walking in, there it was. The figure we seen at the beginning standing right on the edge of the property line, staring directly at us. But now we could see it in fine detail. It was about seven feet tall with broad shoulders and the stature akin to a man. Wearing a blacker than black cloak and a deer skull on its head with piercing red glowing eyes, it then raised his hand to its chest and waved a single wave from its chest to its hip. Then it vanished into the woods behind it. We then went inside and all fell asleep immediately after vowing to never, ever go out there again. But funnily enough, years later, we have all agreed to go camping in those very woods next week. If anything happens, I'll keep you updated. This was my first time sharing this story. So... My question to you is, what do you think was out in that forest? I never tell this story because of how absolutely fake it sounds, but one time scared the heck out of me as a kid. I'm not a hunter, but when I was around 14 or 15... I went with my cousin and brother to go check out some land my cousin's friend's family bought to fish on. The land was a good few acres and located right next to their very large suburban neighborhood in Georgia. 
All you had to do was pull onto the curb in the neighborhood and take a small dirt path across the lake. And after a small turn, the path ran about a mile in a straight line down the middle of the property to a larger lake. When we went, we took a golf cart, since nobody wanted to walk, and pulled onto the property. After taking the small left turn onto the main path, we all just froze. Walking towards us at the opposite end of the path, there was a man with a jacket and ski mask on. We all saw him. He wasn't holding anything. He wasn't running. But he wasn't speaking either. We stopped the golf cart, but we couldn't turn around on the path since it was so thin and there was foliage to both sides of us. The person was still at least a half a mile down the path, just walking, but we were all still terrified. Also, it didn't help that the oldest in our group was 16 and the driver was 12. Despite being young, however, my cousin put the golf cart in reverse, which makes the loudest high-pitched whine ever and reversed the entire quarter mile, pedaled to the metal, which is still pathetically slow in an electric golf cart. When we told his parents, all of the adults came out with us and looked all over, as well as set up two plot watchers. They had to see if they spotted anything. There was nothing on the cameras, and they still have never seen anyone in those woods since then, despite hunting there all the time. In 2002, when I was 16, my parents went on vacation. While they were gone, I stayed at my older sister's, Lisa's, apartment with her and my eight-year-old niece, Sarah. It was during fall break, so Sarah and I were out of school. Since it was only a two-bedroom apartment, Lisa let me sleep in Sarah's room, and Sarah slept in Lisa's room with her. On this particular morning, Sarah and I both slept in. She was so excited that I was staying with them, she wanted to stay up all night watching Disney movies. So, we did. Lisa had fallen asleep on the sofa, so I picked Sarah up and put her in Lisa's bed. Then I went to bed myself. The next morning, I woke up to a man's voice. Lisa's boyfriend, Gary, had a very recognizable, deep voice, kind of like Van Diesel. This voice wasn't Gary's voice at all. This voice was an older man, and he sounded very agitated. I went into the living room to see who was there, and I saw the man sitting on the love seat closest to the front door, and Lisa was sitting in a chair adjacent to the love seat. He looked to be in his 60s, and his shirt and jacket were nearly covered in blood splatter. She shot a fearful, surprised glance at me, as if she forgot I was there. The man stopped talking once he noticed Lisa had looked away from him. I made eye contact with him, and he smiled. Then he placed the gun that he was holding onto the coffee table in front of him. I couldn't move. I didn't know what to do. My first thought was to get between him and Lisa somehow, but I knew I had to stay where I was because... He would have to get past me to get to the bedroom where Sarah was still sleeping. I searched the man's face trying to figure out who he was. He looked familiar, but I couldn't place him. He broke the silence. Hey, I didn't know anybody else was here. I'm Eddie, Gary's stepdad. I faked a smile and gave him a weak wave. He took out a cigarette and lit it. Lisa was still sitting on the sofa, seemingly bracing herself for whatever Eddie had planned. Eddie motioned for me to sit down on the bigger sofa across from him. I did as he said. He took out a bag of weed and some rolling papers and began to roll a joint. You smoke, youngster? He asked me. Lisa spoke up. No, he doesn't. That's my baby brother. He's only 16. Eddie laughed looked at Lisa, then me, and said, <laughs> Well, damn, what the hell y'all feeding these kids? That's a big one right there. Lisa laughed nervously. 
Eddie joined her, seemingly unaware of how uncomfortable we were. Oh shit, I got sidetracked. Let me, <laughs> let me finish telling you what this crazy girl did, Lisa. Eddie went on to tell Lisa that he had just shot and killed a woman he knew because she stole $100 from him the previous night after he had passed out drunk at home. He said he knew it was her because he had pistol whipped Gary's mother and made her tell him who went through his wallet while he slept. He then told Lisa he regretted not killing Gary's mother because he felt like she had set him up somehow. He said she'd also shot the woman's husband, but was unsure if he was dead. He laughed and said he knew for sure the woman was dead because her head exploded like a watermelon. My stomach was in knots. I was sweating, and I could no longer hide my fear. I heard Lisa's bedroom door open from where I sat. I saw Sarah walking across the hallway into the bathroom. Eddie looked in the direction of the hallway. Damn, Lisa, who else is here? Lisa spoke quickly. It's Sarah. Please, Eddie, you know I don't allow smoking around her. Can you please go out on the patio with that? Lisa's voice trembled. Eddie must have heard the fear in her voice because he replied, Girl, what you scared of? I ain't gonna do nothing to you. You good people. I just wanted to come back and see you before I headed out. You know the police is probably looking for me by now. But I just couldn't leave without seeing my favorite spades partner. Eddie smiled as he stood up and gathered his bag of weed, the joint, and gun. I heard the toilet flush, then the sound of water running in the bathroom. I began to pray that Sarah wouldn't come out here before he left. Eddie must have read my thoughts because he said, Don't worry, young blood. I'm going to get on out of here before that baby can see me like this. Lisa and I both stood up as he walked to the door. Lisa opened the door for him and he walked out. We watched through the window as he got into his car and drove away. Lisa quickly grabbed the phone and dialed 911. Sarah came out of the bathroom and asked if the scary man was gone. Lisa said yes and hugged Sarah. Sarah began to tell me she never liked Eddie because he acted strange and looked extremely scary. When she heard his voice on her way to the bathroom, she stayed in there because she didn't want to come out and see him. I was pacing back and forth trying to process what had just happened. Lisa explained that Eddie was a drug addict and alcoholic. Gary's mother had kicked him out, but he would keep popping up at her house. She was already aware that Eddie had attacked Gary's mother because Gary had called to tell her. Though they didn't know he'd killed anyone when he came to Lisa's house. Eddie was arrested shortly after our encounter, and we had to talk to detectives. They told us the man he shot had died on the way to the hospital. It took years for me to forget the way he gleefully described killing that woman. He died in prison not long after he was convicted of those murders. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true creepy encounters. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Colt Stonewolf, Nat Davies, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita B., Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Buzz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continuous support. As I've always said, without you, there wouldn't be a me and there would never be a Back to Ashes channel. Thank you so much. If you're sleeping, I hope Summerland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. Stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.